boy what a wonderful occasion I'm so glad that I can be here with you the Lord is good is he not and to look out and see all of these faces uh, ready to hear the word of God and um, I was blessed by uh, our singing I love going back and forth um, uh, and the languages was beautiful. And you look out and see your faces, and I think about, yes, you know, three years ago, I remember um, you come in with a bunch of young men, um, and some young ladies as well, um, and God was moving on your heart and the hearts of them. And as we began to talk about maybe the Lord would have you plant a church uh, in the South Bay area, and here we are. Amazing. I, I'm a, I have a privileged life. Someone was mentioning that earlier. I have the opportunity to travel many places and see the many events, what the Lord is doing. And this is a special event to be here um, to share this moment with you and this moment in time. And I look forward to see what the Lord may do in the future, because when a person can approach, you know, ministry with a heart that is open, a heart that wants to bring glory in honor to Christ, then you can only anticipate that the Lord might do great things. And to look out and see your faces already gathered here, I'm really, really thoroughly encouraged. I just remember the first time even going down to the Tuesday study and, uh, and teaching there with you and seeing that develop and grow and relationships grow and I don't know what the Lord is going to do, but, but I suspect that he'll do something um, that will bring him glory. And that's all we ever want, isn't it? And if we can say we did a work and we did a work and we did it to the glory of God, then we can say a mission accomplished because that is the whole of our life. And why don't you pray with me before we go to the word of God. Father, thank you for these moments you've given us. And pray that you would take these words to the hearts of these dear people. And that for those that may be here that don't know Christ, that you might open eyes. For those that are here that know Christ, that you would illumine their eyes, that they would see more of you. We bless you. Give me strength and clarity in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you know, as we talked about uh, me coming and preaching the word of God and the question came up, as always, what text would I preach? What would be the theme? What would be the main idea? And uh, one thing that we, even this week on campus, talking with your pastor and, and even others that uh, are even here now, um, that uh, we joke a bit that I would come and I would bring the heat. Um, well, we do need a bit of heat, um, but I'm going to bring a different type of heat. And that he comes from God's word. There are truths in God's word. And the question is, what text would bring the heat, if you will? What text would bring some sense that God is speaking to our hearts and hopefully God's word would warm our hearts and we would respond to God properly because we've heard from him? And I began to think about that. And as I thought and I told uh, Julie that it would be something that is addressing the idea that we all need to be missionaries, we all need to be gospel proclaimers, we all need to be evangelists. Because if you're going to plant the church, and if you don't have people in that church who have a heart to share the gospel with other people, it's really not properly a church plant. It's, it's not even a church, as a matter of fact. Because there are places that gather, and they're gathering right now, and they're gathered just because the preacher or the speaker really is a popular person or they they have a certain craft um, in speaking but they don't really gather because they want to be equipped they want to be matured so they can go into the world and they can reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ a church plant cannot be a people who don't have a heart for the laws it just can't no church can say we're a church, but we don't have a heart for the laws. 
No individual believer can say, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I have no heart for the laws. Even on our way driving down here, my son asked me a question about, you may have seen it in the news or in social media, about what is happening in Kentucky at Asbury University and whether or not it's a true revival or not. And time will tell us there are indications that maybe it is not. There's a great deal of emotion happening. But a true revival is essentially this. It is saying, bring us back to where we were before. Bring us back to what we knew was our purpose, what we knew was our drive, what we knew was our future. And what do I mean by that? Bring us back to the sense that here is our purpose in life. And it is to serve God. Here is our purpose in life. It is to be more like God. Here is our purpose in life. It is to reach the lost with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So no revival can say it's a revival if people don't walk away saying, I'm a sinner. Thank God I'm forgiven. I'm a sinner. And now I've been called to reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we were to just gather here, say for instance, if we were to gather every Sunday and hear the word preach, and, and we were to gather here and have great fellowship, and if we were to gather here and hear great music before us, and we could sing from our heart's content some of the songs that we sang earlier and even more, and if we don't walk away from here saying, I need to reach someone with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's worthless. It's worthless. GCC South Bay has lost its purpose before it really even begins. But I'm convinced that's not the case. I'm convinced that you're people who want to serve the Lord. I'm convinced that you're people who want to surrender more and more of your life to Him. I'm convinced that you're people who want to go to wherever you live and to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that other people can even perhaps feel this room and other people can be snatched from the clutches of the enemy in their own sin. That's our purpose in life. And so the question is, and if that's our purpose in life, then where do we look for the example? And you know exactly what I'm about to say. That example is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in our message, even this morning, the purpose that I want to share with you is that we need to look to Jesus Christ as the example. And if you were to give the message a title, it would be this. Jesus the model evangelist. Jesus, the model evangelist. And you might even say Jesus, the model missionary. He was the great missionary evangelist. Everyone that's in this room, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're called to be a missionary of sorts. You're called to be an evangelist. So even this morning, I want to share with you why this church, if it is to be a biblical church, a successful church in the eyes of God and not man, it must be filled with people who have a passion, a desire, a commitment to reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must look no other place except for the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the model in everything. Now, I pause for a moment and ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the model in everything? Can you say amen to that? Indeed, he is that model. And we find ourselves, if we're to be honest as well, we find ourselves not following that model the way that we should. We're not imitating Christ the way that we should. We're not serving him with the passion that we are surely obligated to have. And a passion that brings us joy when we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Essentially, let me say it this way, we're all falling short. But it will fall short. We'll fall short a year from now. We'll fall short 10 years from now. And if God gives us strength, we'll fall short 50 years from now. And that won't be corrected until you make your way to heaven. But while we're here, we must keep striving, keep being better, keep wanting to be more like Christ. And in this area, we must strive with all of our strength. So I want to provide for you seven ways in which Jesus Christ is the model evangelist and that we can follow him. I'm hoping that when we consider them, 
your heart should be motivated. You would be motivated to strive for God even more. You would be motivated to correct things perhaps in your life and how you schedule your life and how you prioritize your life and the things that you're passionate about in life and say, God, I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and be a model evangelist like he. Here's the first consideration for you. Uh, this church is to be a biblical church, and if you're to be a biblical Christian, really, you must consider Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a model evangelist because he displayed uncompromising character. We might even say simplify. Jesus Christ is a great evangelist because of his character. It all begins with character. You know, there was a day when ministers were considered to be men who were to be honest and pure. There was an expectation of them. And there was an expectation of believers that we would be people that had lives that were different and we were distinct from the world. And we we're people of holiness and people of integrity and people of genuine passion for things that are eternal. If we're to be a spiritual people, it begins with character. And we do live in an age, sadly, when character is not seen as necessary to lead, but it is. Sometimes we look more for not a person's character, but we look for their abilities, their talents, their skills. These are indicators instead of character. Character is absolutely necessary. And all of you here, if you're a believer, you have different tools that you can offer the Lord. And some of your tools or your abilities and your talents, whether they be spiritual or natural, are different than others. But everyone here must be using those tools for the glory of God. And Jesus Christ did that, and he in part did it because of his character. Now, Jesus Christ's character was this way. His character was absolute, and his character was practical. You say, why am I making a difference? Jesus had an absolute character. What do I mean by Jesus and his absolute character? His absolute character is his essence because of who he is. He is divine. He is God. So then he has an absolute character. He was unstained from the fall. And this is why the scripture refers to him as the second Adam. The first Adam failed was Jesus Christ. The second Adam lived a life of absolute perfection. And he lived a life of absolute perfection because his character, his person, is absolutely perfect. He is God. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world because he is a perfect sacrifice. He also had a practical character. By practical character, I mean, uh, this is how he actually lived his life. This is how he manifested his absolute perfection. It is him showing sacrifice and compassion. And it's him showing everyday purity. It's him showing purpose in life. He was a man of character. You saw it in his holiness and his righteousness and his faithfulness and how he showed mercy to people. Um, when he walked amongst the earth, people would see something about him and they would say, this man is different. And they saw it in his words and in his actions. He manifested. Now, all of us who are believers, we are absolutely forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ. When God sees us, we are unstained because God sees us through our relationship to Jesus Christ. But yet, a practical life, we're striving to match it with our absolute life before God. That is, God sees us, we are his children, we are his sons, we are his daughters, because we have been forgiven by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Christ is now our righteousness, but yet we must live that righteousness out in life. And that's where at times we fail and we stumble and we fall. And it is what we call progressive sanctification. We are progressing in our sanctification before the Lord. Jesus Christ did not progress in his sanctification. He was absolutely sanctified, and he just manifested it practically before people. And that's what we are called to do. And this is why Jesus Christ even said that we are supposed to allow our light to shine before the world. How we live is important. How we make decisions is important. 
how we live before the world is important. He was a very different person, and people saw that. And that's why even some would say he does not teach like the scribes. He teaches with authority. That's why people would see him and they say, there's something different about you. You must be a prophet. And that's why even when the soldiers were coming to him to arrest him, and they, they knew something was different about him because he, they asked him, and he says, I am. And the soldiers would fall back because Jesus Christ was a man of character. It exemplified itself even in evangelism. That is, we should do it. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. In 1 Peter 2, notice these words. In 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, it says here, in verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now here we see a relationship between our character, our life, how we live, and even evangelism. Because what does he say? You're aliens and strangers. Why is that important? Live as if your mind, your thoughts, your hopes, your desires are on eternity. This is not your home. Do we all agree with that? And who would want this to be their home anyway? Do any of you want this to be your home? Oh, absolutely not. And it is not our home. He says, now what you must do is make sure that you're in a battle and that the world is fighting against you. But what must you do? Your behavior. Make sure it's excellent. When people see how you live, so that they will glorify you in the day of visitation. That is, your life would influence them so much that it may be a role for them to come to Christ. Character is absolutely important. You know, it was a great missionary, C.T. Studd, who said this, and I love this quote. And he said this, If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. If he is God, and he is, and he died, and he did, then what sacrifice can we make that would be too great? None. We should be evangelists and consider this a part of Jesus' life. Number two, Jesus was a model evangelist because he displayed great fortitude. Great fortitude. What do I mean by that? He was resolved. A person of character is undoubtedly a person of fortitude. They will complete tasks. They are committed. They will sacrifice whatever is needed. Let's go on a bit of a journey. Notice Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. Turn with me to John's Gospel. And we're going to turn to a number of passages or just listen as I refer to them. John 5.17 is our first stop. John 5.17, and it says there, he says, My father is working, I myself am working. Notice verse 19 of chapter 5. The son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. Notice verse 43 of chapter 5. I have come in my father's name. Now turn with me to chapter 10 of John's Gospel. Chapter 10 in John's Gospel. What does it say there? For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so to take it again. Verse 18. This commandment I receive from my Father. Turn with me to chapter 12 in John's Gospel. Notice chapter 12, verse 27. He says, Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Notice chapter 14 of John's Gospel. 14, verse 31. 
but so that the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Get up, let us go from here. Chapter 18 of John's Gospel beautifully states, here's Jesus Christ closer and closer to the cross, closer and closer to sacrificing. And what does it say? Put the word in its sheath. The cup which the Father's given me, shall I not drink? And what had happened? Remember, at that moment, uh, the disciple takes out the sword and he cuts off the ear of the servant. And in that moment, what does Jesus do? He actually touches his side and he heals him. But yet they still don't see that he is the Christ. And he says, put away the sword. Shall I not drink this cup? I am resolved. I am committed. And in verse 29, notice what it says. And he who sent me is with me. And he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That's one of the most beautiful verses um, in all the word of God. I mean, when you think about that for a moment, where he says, he makes this statement, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And that's not 18, that's in chapter 829, 829. I love that verse. Ask your question. For those of you here that you know the Lord Jesus Christ, wouldn't you want that verse to be, wouldn't it, put it this way, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could claim that verse? I mean, in this sense, I always do the things that are pleasing to my Father. What a joy that would be. To say, I always do the things that are pleasing to my Father. Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ was a man of fortitude. He was committed. I, I want you to notice something in the verses that I read. What pattern do you notice in those verses? What motivates Jesus Christ? There's a unique feature of John's gospel, and it is this idea of son and father that's highlighted like no other gospel. Father. Why do you know it? Because think about this. In Mark's gospel, we see the idea of father four times. Four times father. In Luke's gospel, you see father six times. Just six times father. You go to Matthew's gospel. And you see Father referencing his heavenly Father. You see it 23 times. And actually 17 of them are just in the Sermon on the Mount. Right there in the Sermon on the Mount. Your heavenly Father, your Father, your Father. 23 times in Mark's, Luke's Gospel. Six times. Mark's Gospel four times. If you go to the Gospel of John, do you know how many times you see a reference to Father? 107 times. 107 times. So the question is, what is motivating Jesus Christ? He is motivated by ple being pleasing to his Father. He was determined to please his Father. You have a heavenly Father if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And it must be your heartbeat. It must be your passion that you would want to please him. In Luke 9, turn there with me to Luke 9. Look at Luke's gospel for a moment. Luke 9, 51. 9, 51. He was in, indeed determined. Notice 9, 51. And what does it say? When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. There's a great deal that's communicated in that one verse. Uh, the New King James Version says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Uh, the English Standard Version says he set his face to go to Jerusalem. One other translation, the Net Bible says Jesus resolutely set out to Jerusalem. W what is it communicating here? Because this word, when it says he was determined in Luke's Gospel elsewhere, in Luke 16, 26, uh, there's a rich man in Lazarus, and uh, the rich man is wanting Lazarus to come and, and dip his finger in some water to cool his tongue because he's in torment in hell. 
and what is communicated is that no, he can't come because there's a there's a fixed wall, there's a chasm between the two of you, between the two of you. You cannot come over, and he cannot come to you. It is fixed. It's determined. It's the same word that's used in Jesus Christ. He was determined. He was fixed on it. The question is for all of us: How fixed are we in our life? How determined are we? How determined are you to speak to your neighbor about Christ? How determined are you? Are you speak to your co-workers about Christ? What about your family members to speak to them about Christ? What about even those of your enemies to speak to them about Christ? I mean, think with me for a moment, even that account. And if you turn with me, perhaps they're not intended or not in my notes, but turn there to Luke 16. In Luke 16. And I just want you to hear these words again. The poor man died, 22, he's carried away by the angel of Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried in Hades. He lifted, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away in Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Pause for a moment. Consider that, friend. How many of you have loved ones right now? If they were to die, if you were to get a phone call, if someone were to say to you, Grandma, such and such, your uncle, your brother, your sister, your cousin, they've gone into eternity. Where would they be? I have loved ones. And a couple that every once in a while when I get a phone call, I'm wondering, is this the phone call that says now they're gone? I want, is this the phone call that's going to tell me, Carl, you have to come home? Because I know with some of them, if I get that phone call and they don't come to Christ, they are going to be in agony or in eternity. What will you do? Will you be an evangelist like Christ? There's something else we can learn from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a model evangelist because he was dependent on the Father. He was dependent on the Father. Yes, he is God, but how was he dependent? He was a man of prayer. If you look to the Gospels, you see this of Jesus Christ. He would go to the mountain, and it says he would go to the mountain early, or he would go alone, or he would go often. And even he went to pray when he was in agony before he would be crucified. We should be like him, and we should be praying for hearts to be receptive to the gospel. We should pray, Lord, I'm about to go visit them again. Will you soften their heart? Lord, will you give me the opportunity to share the gospel with this person? Will you soften their heart and heart? I can think about someone that I know right now that is very close in her family, and they're getting closer and closer to the final breath in this life. And maybe the Lord will give them a couple more years. I'm not sure. But I know that when they pass into eternity, right now, it is going to be a sad moment for so many people in our family because they have heard the gospel so many times and they've turned away from it. But still, we must pray that their hearts should be soft. Are you a praying person? Jesus Christ prayed. Are you a person that can say, God, give me the boldness to speak? That's what Paul did in Ephesians 6.20. He said, pray for me that I might speak boldly as I ought to speak. Even the apostle Paul needed prayer. Prayer is important. I mentioned being a missionary as well. Uh, a book that I read now, man, it's over 30 years ago. 30 years ago, was on the life of Hudson Taylor, who was a missionary to China. And the title of the book is Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. And what's interesting about Hudson Taylor, 
at his death in 1905, there were 205 stations with 850 missionaries. And there were 125,000 Christians in the China Inland Mission. But one secret to what Hudson Taylor did for the Lord was prayer. If you read his life, he was a man that would commit his work to the Lord. He would pray for the hearts of people to be receptive. He would pray for people to come to faith. And he would spend hours upon hours in prayer. So the question for you then, even as a church, you look around you. The many people that are in this community and surrounding communities, will you commit them to prayer? Will you commit to people of Carson and Torrance and Lakewood and Redondo Beach to prayer? We say, God, will you give us souls? Your pastor can tell you, even in the class that I have him for the prayer in the past, we were talking about this very thing in class on, on Wednesday. And I said, I need to commit more time for even when I preach on Sunday. And I'm praying that these people will be inspired to be evangelists for Christ through prayer. How many of you can look back and remember that someone prayed for you? You lived a life that was displeasing to the Lord, but someone prayed for you and prayed that you would be, your heart would be soft. And that's the story of my life. And I'm not sure if I shared it before one of our Tuesday times, but nonetheless, I share it again because of people that have not heard it. When I came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when I was at the University of Cincinnati, and uh, life I thought was going well for me, but it really wasn't. It was lined up for me from a, a natural standpoint, but from a spiritual standpoint, I was also headed to hell. I thought that I knew the Lord, but I didn't know the Lord. I could tell you what it meant to, quote, be a Christian. I can tell you what you should say to witness to a Christian. I could walk you through the book of Romans and say, here are the things that you should know and what it means to be a Christian. But sadly, I was not truly a believer. And one day, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his grace, opened my eyes when I was there in my dorm room, and I realized that I was a sinner, and I came to faith in Christ. And you know what I did? There's someone that I called, the first person I called, because my mom passed away when I was very early, uh, at a very early age for me, that is. And I called her youngest sister, my Aunt Mildred. And my Aunt Mildred uh, would pray for me often. And I said, your Aunt Mildred, I said, her, these are my very words. And these words were uttered. I came to the Lord in 1983. So 40 years ago. I have an anniversary. I just thought about that. I'm, I'm nearly 40 years in the Lord. In April, it would be 40 years in the Lord. And you know what my aunt said to me? The first thing she said to me was this. Carl, I pray for you every day. Are you going to pray for people that you know? Are you going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you going to bow your knees before heaven? As a church, we say as a church, Lord, give us people from Torrance. Lord, give us people from Carson, from Redonda Beach, from Long Beach, from Lakewood. Lord, give us family members. Lord, give us our children. This is what we must do. So then maybe someone else will come to faith and you can say to that person, I pray for you every day. Every day. He was a man of prayer. Jesus was also this. Number four, he was a model evangelist because he displayed genuine concern for people. Genuine concern for people. Yes, his character was true. Absolutely a, a man of prayer. Absolutely he was a man of fortitude. But he had a concern for people. Now, as we think about his concern for people, there are many ways that we can consider this. And I just want to reflect on one aspect of his concern shown in his heart of compassion. If we were to take a brief look through the life of Christ, turn with me, if you will, to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 9. Matthew 9, and it says this, Matthew 9, 13, and he states, but go and learn what it means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. 
I did not come to call the righteous, but what did he came to do? He came to do what? Call who? Sinners. Sinners. You are gathered here as a church to be edified as a church so you can leave this building and go and call sinners to Christ. That is your purpose in life. This is why you need biblical churches so you can mature biblical believers so they can go and preach a biblical message so that sinners can come to faith in Christ. This is why you need expository preaching. This is why you need Bible study. This is why you need discipleship so that you can be mature so you can go and preach Christ to sinners. That was the purpose of Christ. So notice, if you will, in chapter 9, verse 36. And what does he say? Seeing the people, notice Christ, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion. A beautiful word, compassion. It's, especially in the Hebrew language, it's a beautiful word. It, it comes from this idea of it. The inward parts, even literally inward parts of a, of a sacrifice at times it was used in the Greek language. In the Hebrew language, it's referring to sort of our gut. And why does it refer to that? Because often when you feel compassion for someone, your heart goes out to them. Maybe you hear a, a sad story in the news. Some tragedy has happened. You feel something and you feel something towards them. And this is what it's saying. Christ had a feeling towards them of compassion. But yet that compassion led him to an action. Because you may say, well, I have compassion. You really don't have compassion unless you act on it. This was the attitude of Jesus Christ. You see it in Matthew 14, 14. He had compassion for them. In Matthew 15, 32, I feel compassion for the multitude. Matthew 20, 34, he says, and move with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes. You see it throughout. Jesus and compassion. We look around in the world and we must be a people of compassion. Do you have concern for people? Do you look at their state and realize they're without Christ? You have to act on compassion. I have a habit, I mentioned before, that I travel and I'm fortunate to travel to the Lord. Um, but whenever I get in, uh, especially if I get in Uber or Lyft, um, I have a habit. I do it all the time. I've done it all over the world. Um, I'm in the car, and I, I ask that person, friend, you ever think about religion? Oh, yeah, I, mean, I kind of have my own way about things. What do you mean by that? Or someone would say, yeah, I do. I'm a Roman Catholic. Okay, what does that mean? Do you, or uh, I've talked to people, yes, I'm, I'm a Hindu. Okay, let's talk about that. I've talked to people that say I'm a Buddhist. I've talked to any number of people that say, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a Muslim. I practice Islam. I'm a follower of Muhammad. Or I've talked to people that says, no, I'm just not interested in religion. I don't like religion. I like Jesus, but I don't like religion. Well, let's talk about that. And I share the gospel with them. And I give them a track, and I said, would you read this? Why? I don't know who else is going to share the gospel. And I've hired them out. They're, they're essentially there. I've hired them, correct, right? They're working for, for me right now. And I imagine sometimes you hear Christians say, well, I'm looking for an opportunity to share the gospel. No, stop looking and just share the gospel. I mean, you're going to be forever looking. I hear people all the time. I'm just looking for that opportunity. I'm just looking for the opportunity. Is it here? Is it there? I wonder when I can share the gospel. Where is it? It's right in front of you. Because somebody who doesn't know the Lord is right in front of you. Stop looking for the gospel and just share the gospel. And then I hear this what Christians will say. Well, I have to, I have to earn the right to share the gospel. That is ludicrous. Don't ever repeat that again, except to tell them that they're wrong. Okay? No. You don't have to get the right to share the gospel. You have. Let me tell you something. Let me make it clear. 
If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a son of the living God. Are you not? Can you say amen to that? Are you not a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Can you say amen to that? Has he not commissioned you to go into the world? Can you say amen to that? And if he has in fact commissioned you, the very Lord of the universe has told you to go into the world, how do you figure you need to ask the world the right to share what the king told you to share? No, it doesn't work that way. I have been commissioned. And I hear that a lot. And even in Bible churches sometimes. Well, we have to get the right to share the gospel. No, I don't. I have the right. Because the king gave me the right. Amen. Now stop looking for opportunities and just take advantage of what is in front of you. So yes, you're right. He's working for me right now. I will share the gospel with you. What are you going to do? They'll give me a bad rating on Uber or Lyft? So what? So what? But you hear truth today. So here's a fifth thing, reason Jesus was a good evangelist. He had great skill in communicating his message. Great skill in communicating. Because what's the point if you understand certain things but you can't communicate it to another person? Communication is necessary in every relationship. Um, this I can't go to them all the time. is escaping me. Mark 6, 2, we see him communicating. Matthew 7, 28, 29, communicating. John chapter 7, 40 to 49. The skill in communicating that sometimes may not overcome a hardened heart. Jesus Christ was perfect, the perfect preacher. But yet people still rejected him. They still rejected him. So don't think, let me caution you here. Don't think just because you've said things a certain way and you have responded to their argument that now they're going to come to Christ. Maybe not. There have been times I shared with someone the gospel and they had arguments against what I'm saying and I'll share this script with them and they have another argument and I'll counter it this with them and I'm thinking, oh, this person is going to come to faith right now. They're going to, the next thing they're going to say to me is what must I do to be saved? And what do they say? Oh, it's not for me. Wow. It's not for me. So yes, show skill in communicating. Jesus Jesus showed skill. He taught in parables. That was skill. He used what's called hyperbole. That was skill. He used what's called simile. This is light. That's skill. He taught to large crowds and small crowds. That's skill. But in the end, unless the Holy Spirit works in the person's heart, they won't come to faith in Christ. Number six. How do we know Jesus was a great evangelist and why should we follow him? Because he understood his goal. Number six, he understood his goal. Why a church plant in the South Bay? Why, for some of you, why change the mode of your life? Why sell what you have and say, I'm going to give myself to preaching the gospel? Why maybe say, you know, I'm going to join this work instead of where I was before and help them build this church? Why, why here? Why are we gathered even here today? Because you understand your goal, which is to have more biblical churches that can preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those that need to hear it. You know, with Grace Advance, we do uh, work and help churches start, and, and you're off to a wonderful start here. I briefly tell you a story of someone who didn't understand their goal. It was a man that we were in conversation with many years ago about planting a church in an area near him, and I do say near him, but we wanted to talk with him about it, and we did. And that man said this to me. He said, we already have enough Bible churches in the area. Now, pause for a moment. You ask yourself a question. Man, do you understand your goal in life, your purpose in life? It is to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to support biblical works so more and more people can hear. Now, he said, we already have enough. How many do you have? And I already knew the answer. He said, if another one comes, we'll have four Bible churches in the area. Four. Now, okay, I can understand this point, perhaps. If there were four Bible churches, and say, for instance, you wanted to plant the fourth church 
and it's a neighborhood of 400 people, you might think, okay, that, yeah, you're probably right. Let's go somewhere else. But you know that's not the case. And I won't tell you where the area is located, but I'll tell you how many people are located in this area, this near Portland. Um, and here it is. How many people in that area? I said, hold on, sir. Hold on, sir. And I said that to him. And you can ask George Crawford. I think we told this story in one of our meetings before. There are 500,000 people in that area. 500,000. And you tell me, and I had this posture with him. I, I, if, I can't say that because I'm a preacher. <laughs> Four churches. So now we can have 125,000 each. And this poor fellow had 65 in his. Now it's not because the, the 65 isn't the issue. Do you understand me, right? You can't say there's not room for another church. And there's a half a million people to be reached. That's because you don't understand your goal. Jesus Christ understood his goal. He said, Luke 2.42, I must be about my father's business. I was just reading through the Gospel of John just a couple days ago. And I love that account. And his parents, as you know the story, they're wondering, where is Jesus? They're, they have come to Jerusalem and now they're going back again. And they're wondering, what is happening here? And they find him and he says, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He understood his goal. John 4.34 says, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Do you know your father's business? What food satisfies you? Are you like Jesus Christ saying, if that's the cup God gives me, I will drink it. And because he understood his goal, my last point is this. He was willing to die for his goal. The things that are dear to us, we're willing to sacrifice for. In Jesus Christ, it says, he breathed his last. Before he breathed his last, he went down that Via Della Rosa. And before that, imagine him being mocked and spat upon and slapped. And beat him. He died for his goal. Jesus Christ knew his goal. He was willing to pay a, pay a price for it. Jesus Christ said what? In Mark's gospel, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Question for you. Question for you. What are you willing to sacrifice? What area of your life must you die to be about your father's business? What food are you dining on now? Will you be an evangelist like Christ? And will this church have a heart like Christ to win the loss for the glory of his name? Father, we thank you for these words you've given us. We pray that you would use them, encourage our hearts with them, in Christ's name. Amen.